All right, welcome back to Mech 1340. We're getting into Chapter 6. All right, getting into um, a lot of the inputs and outputs and things like that, understanding how to write the ladder logic from it. Um, when we're going to go through this, uh, you know, some of this is going to be review. Uh, we did a lot of this in the electrical class and in the mechanical class. So some of these might be review, some of these might be new. Uh, but, you know, uh, I expect you guys to know all the symbols. We will have a test on all the symbols uh, as well. So just make sure that you understand them. And then at the end, we're going to get through some narratives that uh, help us write a ladder logic program. All right. So we talked in an earlier lecture, you know, why a PLC was designed. All right. Our whole purpose is to um, replace control relays because of wiring and cost. And, and that, you know, the big issue is we can make a quick change in a PLC program and a ladder logic program. Uh, and we don't actually have to physically go out to the field and rewire the device, uh, which could take, you know, a couple hours and you get into a messy cabinet and those sort of things. So we still use relays uh, to, to open and close, all right, but we control them with a PLC. We don't wire, you know, relay to relay and that sort of thing with relay logic. But We've talked about relays before. They're just really an electric uh, magnetic switch type scenario, right? Where we uh, remember when we put current through a wire, it creates a magnetic field. So when we send current, you know, to a coil, it creates magnetic field and opens or closes the switch. Kind of just depends on if we're normally open or close. All right. So uh, just an up close, you know, we've passed one round of class before, but how the contacts look. Here, right and it's a spring return so it's auto return once that magnetic field uh, goes away it opens back up so in this example here on the left hand side we have a normally open contact okay and notice the clappers are all open and then when we energize the coil right we're putting current through it creating that magnetic field on the right hand side it closes the clapper and creates the circuit all right, so the circuits, the upper left-hand side where the fixed contacts are. So closing one, open, one is open, right? And then the other one closes to complete the path uh, so that we can, you know, turn things on or do those sort of things. So two kinds of contacts, and this is, you know, kind of the fundamentals of our ladder logic as well. We have normally closed contacts, so the clappers are closed, okay, and then they open when we energize the coil. So the magnetic field actually opens them in this case instead of closes them. Or vice versa, right? If we have contacts that start out normally open and we energize the coil, they close the contacts. So you need to understand the difference between, you know, normally open and normally closed. Those are the initial state of the contacts. So if we just wired up, no power or anything going to it, all right, are we normally open or normally closed? And that kind of just, you know, falls into the design specs. Are we using something normally open or normally closed there? Note the symbol for normally closed, all right? It's the two bars with that line slash through it. So that means it's normally closed. So which means in normal operation, if we kick on power, most likely everything's gonna be flowing through there because the contactors are already closed. Whereas normally open, all right, there's nothing necessarily going through those until the inner until the coil closes. All right, and normally open, they're just the two parallel bars. Looks very similar to like a capacitor type symbol. Okay, uh, if we use relay symbols, okay, so a couple different things. If we have a circle, all right, that's what's going to show up on our uh, ladder logic. A couple different ways we use a circle. One, uh, a circle with an M in it. Uh, for Siemens, that's going to be a memory coil too, but. Um, for all general purpose ladder logic, you see an M in it, it's a motor contactor, okay? It's the motor starter coil. So uh, what that really relates to on the like schematic is the contact uh, on the right-hand side of the diagram. On the left, the circle with the M in it, that's what we're going to see on our ladder logic, okay? Also, CR, control relay. So we use those for controls, different relays. And you'll see these as we do some schematics. Uh, but we, you know, we, we consider them just a coil on on the uh, output side of our ladder logic where we have you know our contactors normally open normally closed and then this is actually what's energizing when we open and close contactors and things on the other end of things okay so if we have let's go through a couple scenarios so here if we have our switch our switch is open on our control relay i'm going down the left hand side diagram right here okay if our switch is open okay we got a control relay here 
and then we have a normally open control relay contactor and a normally closed. So in the normally closed position, look at the bottom line of the or the bottom rung. All right, the normally closed control relay. Notice since it's normally closed, the green light is on. Okay, so then what happens on the right hand side when we close the switch? What happens? The control relay on rung two closes, turning the red light on, and the control relay on rung three opens, okay, and turns off the green light. So notice the I.O. for the control relay is going to be the same there. All right, so we're going to have the switch. So they're going to go based on the control relay. So if the control relay is not on, we're going to have a green light. If the control relay is on, all right, we have a, a red light on indicating, right, it's operating. So, you know, just, you know, that kind of scenario in there, there is how the control relay, you know, can open or close based on the output coil that's on rung one. So that's really just a basic understanding of how your ladder logic works. All right. So let's start talking about some context. All right. We're going to get into this more in the motor control class uh, as well. We'll probably get a lot more heavier into this and you guys will be doing some wiring up. All right. But we use contactors because... Um, you know, a lot of the motors in industry, we're running 120 volts, we're running 480 volt, three phase, those different kind of things. Our controls run off a 24 volt DC. So we use relays and, uh, you know, these different types of contactors to start higher end voltages and they don't impact our controls. So we can send a signal to close a relay and that relay actually closes all the contactors for the 480 volt, three phase. Uh, type scenario. So this is how we control a lot of motors. Uh, we just have starters and inside the starters we have the contactors. All right, so we have movable contacts. Okay, those are the ones that are affected by the coil, the magnetic field. All right, so those are the ones that are going to automatically open and close based on when we energize the coil in there. So this is really, you know, how we start the majority of motors in industry. And we have a motor distribution center that has all the starters in it. All right, and that sends the signal out to the motors that are out in the field, you know, on the line or doing whatever process it is that they're doing. But that's the main reason we use motor starters and we use relays and things like that because, uh, you know, our control voltages are small voltages and we don't want to be interfered with magnetic field. So everything is going to be 24 volt DC and we want to be able to control a bunch of different AC voltages or things like that or higher end voltages. Okay, so that's really the whole point of, you know, why we do this. The PLC sends the signal to, you know, either we're going to make sure that that coil, you know, turns on or off. And when that coil turns on or off, it closes the contactors uh, for the motor to get started. Okay, and so that's why we have the motor starters. Okay, these are kind of the all-in-one unit. So the, what we talked about before was just the contactor piece of the motor. But this is the motor load, this is the motor starter in general. All right, we have the contactors. All right, so that's what's going to energize the motor if the coil opens or closes. And then we have overload relay protection. So it's detecting current, all right, and it's kind of like, you know, putting a fuse or a breaker right at the motor. So if there's too much inrush current or things like that, it'll trip, okay, and protect the equipment. That's really exactly what the overload relay is for. So every motor starter, okay, is going to have... Uh, an overload relay so you can see that you know kind of schematically here all right so at the top right we have our our stop button that's normally wired close right because when we want to stop something we have to push it so it opens then we have our start button then we have our motor contactor we have our motor coil and then we have our overload relay contactor right the the relay is normally closed always because we want those to open if there's you know, a fault or an inrush current, right? And they're just magnetic relays uh, that depend on the current. And that's really, you know, they're, they're thermocoupled uh, in that instance. So if we look at the schematic here, right, we have the three contactors, the MMM, right, on line one, line two, line three. Those are the contactor portion, okay? And then the overload relay, okay, those are wired in. They're sitting at the bottom here of the, mag of the starter. So if we, I'm gonna take a step back. So if you take a look at this, the bottom piece here, that's the overload relay. The top piece is just the contactors for the motor to start. So the MMM on line one, two, and three, all right, and that line one, two, and three actually stand for, you know, the different phases as they come through, like phase A, B, and C on a three-phase motor and that sort of thing. All right, so, you know, kind of how does this work? 
we can have manual start and stop as well and then we seal it in so that motor coil itself can actually seal it in with our uh, PLC logic so we don't have to sit there and hold the start button for the motor to run the entire time we hit the start button it hits and as soon as the motor coil turns on all right we have a contactor that's oared with the start button here and that seals it in so that the motor will always be running until we hit the stop button that's the only thing that will break the circuit so that motor will be on until the stop button is hit or there's something else that we put in a program uh, that ends it all right so let's talk about manually operated switches you should all be very familiar uh, with these switches we've worked on a lot all right we got push buttons here so uh, obviously red and green green is usually our start button right so that one is always generally for 99% of the circuits right a normally open push button okay so that's what the green is our stop button is normally closed we wire that normally closed right because when we want to push the button we want to stop the circuit so we have to break the circuit okay and then we have a break circuit uh, as well so we can have those set up uh, so you know the two top contactors are closed and then we have open bottom contactors and vice versa okay so that's really what we're doing. Those are manually operated switches. Those are push buttons. Uh, I'm going to test you more on the uh, the NEMA symbols, uh, but do know some of the IEC symbols uh, as well. And there I have a whole PowerPoint. There's a whole page in your book I'll post on the website as well that has all the symbols uh, for you to study. We'll have a whole symbol test. All right. Uh, selector switch. We also have these right on each one of our stations on the 870 trainer for uh, manual right auto and reset uh, when we have those so that's kind of how we have our setup here and so that we can you know run the circuit differently it's a lot different when we run the 870 trainer in auto right i just push the button and everything's able to go if it's in manual okay it's going to wait because i'm in the specific you know position so that would be like hand on this switch here so it waits so that I have to hit the button each time for it to go to the next steps, okay? So, you know, selector switch. You see these on fans, right? We have, you know, one, two, three speed fans and off and that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, the, it can control our variable speed fans, you know, just based on, you know, what voltage that we're going to give uh, to that fan to make it spin faster and that sort of thing. All right. A dip package, a dual inline package, all right, those are just binary switches. We talked a lot about this in uh, in digital electronics a little bit, but it's just a set of binary code, right? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we're sending in, um, a, you know, zeros and ones and things like that. Now, I guess it's, it's kind of always confusing on this, right? Because in the picture uh, on the bottom right, the actual circuit, right, it says one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we know that uh, when we do binary, we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So just know that, but we're setting in a, bina a binary string of, you know, controls uh, into something. And we might want to set it, you know, so it's at a specific binary number that's coming in. Okay, if we have mechanically operated switches, we learned a lot more about these uh, in the mechanical class, right, in the uh, 1320 class. But uh, we spent a lot of time talking about limit switches, right? We did some controls with this stuff uh, in digital electronics as well, right? But limit switches, right? They're a mechanical switch that normally uh, open or normally close when we have the mechanical lever that's pressed, all right? So it's mechanically, right? It, this is on station two, all right? When we move uh, from left to right, all right? The home position, the mechanical switch is closed. When it traverses all the way to the right, all right, so, so that it can, once it scans the correct height and sees if the port's there and, and, and it scans to the next and it moves it over to the right hand side so we can put it onto station two, all right? There's two limit switches at the bottom there uh, that are on that. So that's how we know uh, where the tray is as it goes across. You know, is it at home or is it ready to, you know, dock to the next station? So we can use it, right? The mechanical lever is depressed so when it's depressed, it closes the switch, and closing the switch gives off the electrical signals. All right, so make sure that you know the symbols here for normally open or normally closed limit switches. All right, and we've seen those before on the electrical uh, test as well. All right, temperature operated switches, right? Those should be pretty self-explanatory. They're based on predetermined temperatures. So when you reach a certain temperature, the switch will close, or if we reach a certain temperature, you know, the circuit opens, so something can like, cool off. 
You know, so, you know, think about like your oven at home, right? Uh, if you have to preheat it and you preheat it to like 450 degrees, well, you'll have a, you know, there's a temperature switch in there that knows the temperature of the oven. And when that reaches that specific temperature, you hear that beep, beep, beep. And, you know, it lets you know that your oven's preheated to what you set it to or the oven's set to like that temperature. So, you know, same kind of concept. There's a lot of stuff in industry. You know, we got to be at certain temperatures um, for operations to happen. All right, pressure switches, same thing. Make sure you know the symbols for pressure switches. All right, but they're detecting what? Pressure in the line. So sometimes, you know, for us to turn on a motor, we got to be at a certain temperature and a certain pressure, things like that. We're going to go through, the, you know, those type of scenarios. Um, but we still have normally open and normally closed contactors. And it's just set on, you know, the pressure that we set it to. So when we get to this certain pressure, we can turn on this certain motor. All right, that's really, you know, what they're used for. Level switches, all right, things like this sit in your gas tank, all right, lots of tanks and vats that we have uh, in industry as well. So they're there because they float, all right, and they, they keep track of um, where the level is in the tank, all right. Even your toilet has a very simple one, a ballast in the back end of the toilet when you take the back off, and you can see as it knows, you know, as the water level rises after you flush the toilet, where that goes, all right, and then it shuts off the water from coming in when it reaches a certain level. Same kind of concept here, okay? So this is how you know when you're driving along, you know, when it's my gas tank empty or full or things like that. You may not have this exact type sensor uh, in your gas tank or things like that, but, um, you know, sometimes you have an old school like lawnmower where it just sticks all the way into the gas tank and there's a little floaty on it. It helps kind of tell, you know, where the, the level is. It's not super accurate in that case, but, you know, same kind of concept. We're checking for the level of whatever's in the tank uh, that we need. All right, so different types of sensors. Uh, we've talked about these before, right? We have proximity sensors. So on, like, station three of our 870s trainer, we're using a proximity sensor to detect, you know, is there a part present, uh, you know, on, that, on the indexing station so that it can turn around or those sort of things. All right, uh, you know, is there a metal, right? So we have a metal detector, right, that's detecting, or an inductive um, is the technical term for it, an inductive sensor, right? We're detecting, you know, is there metal or no metal kind of thing. So we can see, you know, those have normally open and normally closed contactors as well. So an inductive one, right, um, that I was just talking about, we only use inductive sensors to detect metal. It cannot detect plastic or anything like that, but they only detect metal. So they can detect ferrous and non-ferrous metals. So remember, ferrous metals are metals that contain iron. Uh, non-ferrous metals are copper or aluminum, brass, all those other kind of things, um, all right? Not as magnetic, all right? So we use those on station four on the 870 trainer. So that separates our plastic valve body from our metal valve body. It detects that it's a metal valve body and moves it. If it's plastic, it doesn't detect anything and just lets the plastic valve body keep going on station four. So that's our inductive proximity sensor. Okay, and there's kind of how we wire up. We're not going to wire anything up uh, in class with these, but just kind of take a note. There are some other proximity sensors that you're going to use on some of the other trainers where you are. You're wiring up, but you're kind of pre-wiring uh, to this piece. The wire's already there. You're just using the other end of the wire to run into your control cabinet. All right. So you know, kind of how do they work? Can we we can adjust the sensitivity on them? All right. So we can make it so they're very sensitive or not very sensitive. You know, kind of just depends on the parts we have coming through and uh, being able to keep that sort of spacing. All right. And then, you know, we got to be able to uh, control leakage current. So we use those, you know, from the sensors that are constantly going to be on. Uh, you don't want to have, there might be some voltage drop or things that are lost across terminals. So we want to make sure that everything, you know, operates correctly. So that we use what we call a bleed resistor. So it, it's enough to allow it to operate, but not enough to turn the uh, input on when we do that. So just remember that we're going to use the bleed resistor um, so that we can constantly keep, um, you know, the, the sensor on, uh, but we allow just enough, you know, 
uh, for the the current to go through and not enough to turn on the sensor okay so that's really kind of the point behind those all right so capacitive proximity sensors uh, we use these on the indexing station on uh, station 3 on the 870 trainer right we're using those to detect part present now these don't detect metal or plastic they literally just detect that something is there all right so it creates kind of like this uh, capacitive electrostatic field that's kind of big a bubble that sits above uh, the sensor and you can adjust the sensitivity on that as well uh, you know keep track of how close something gets uh, when we do that so a lot of you know in industry we use a lot of these for uh, counting and things like that so just you know something goes by it so in this diagram right we got milk on a conveyor belt we're just counting you know how many bottles or gallons of milk have come by you know in a certain amount of time or if we want to you know take them off so that we can palletize things and stuff so you got to count right you know you're palletizing cans or something like that or or a certain number of packs that go on right you got to count how many go by and uh, you know capacitive sensor very very common sensor uh, for us to be able to do that right we're just detecting up oh, something something was present something was present something was present uh, as it goes by all right so magnetic read switches okay we have some read switches on the 870 trainer as well um, on all the traverses and things like that uh, they're the little flat ones uh, you'll kind of see and uh, those are the ones I've shown you when we use a magnet right I can put a magnet next to them and you'll see the light turn on and off because I'm opening and closing that with a magnetic field so very sensitive to magnets um, you know we also have some proximity sensors that are that are read switches that sit on cylinders all right so we can detect if the cylinder is extended or retracted all right but remember the read switches all right we have two flat tabs all right not always in a little glass tube for us but we can kind of see and all we can walk back there on the 870 and we'll go over uh, all these again but you guys can see them so what happens when the magnetic field gets close okay it closes and the circuit turns on so we know that the light says it's there so like on station one we have the linear traverse right we have the home or extended position on it so when it's retracted at home right there's a little reed switch up there with a light on and then when the traverse goes all the way across to station two you know that original home light turns off and when it reaches the fully extended position all right the light turns on it detects the magnetic presence there and says all right there's something there so we use a lot of read switches to detect you know part presence or things like that as well all right so photovoltaic uh we don't have any of these on any of the trainers that we have but you know we're detecting changes in light so we can use photovoltaic so we use uh, a voltage detection or we can use photoconductive and uh, we can do that and we can change like the resistance so those are going to change based on light so you know, uh, example, if you have house lights or things like that, so they turn what? At, uh, at dusk, they turn on, all right, because there's not enough light hitting them, and where light will either change the voltage or light will change the resistance. And then at dawn, when the sun comes back out, all right, that's going to turn the lights off. So we can use that. So they're photo, photo detective, right? They're detecting light. So light can either turn something on or off and you guys remember we did some of this those of you guys that took digital electronics all right with our little bobots and our little robots right we had you use your phones and we were able to make it follow the light or turn away from the light uh, just depending on the code that we wrote so uh there's some other adreno labs that we did with that as well in the electrical class uh, where you guys were able to you know play with the uh the photoconductive or photovoltaic cells that we have all right so you know just another way we can also use them to you know detect a beam of light uh, uh, for transmitting light so like you know a tripwire or laser or things like that we can use that type of light as well now we do infrared and that sort of thing a little bit differently but same kind of you know things like that so anything with light we can use one of those type of sensors so scan beam through so this is what i was talking about kind of like with the lasers before right so if you have your garage door at home, all right, and you at the bottom of each side of your garage door, all right, you have the transmitter and receiver. I think I still have one of these in class to kind of show you as well, right? So that happens. So like if your door is going down and you back out or someone's crossing the path and you have children, all right, they'll break that beam. And when that beam breaks, all right, the door will stop and doesn't crush anything. 
uh, you know, kind of like a sort of like a light curtain as well, right? Light curtains are much bigger uh, in, than this aspect of a single beam, but if you break the light curtain, all right, is uh, same thing. The circuit will shut down. It's for safety. So, like if we look at our big Fanuc robot in the corner, right, we have some area scanners. So, if you step into that scanner and break that beam, okay, you're gonna shut the robot off or things like that. It's all designed for you know backup safety and that sort of thing. Okay, and this is what I talk about when we have you know uh, station three when we're checking to see um, if the valve body needs to be rotated or is in the right position. Uh, so when we do that, all right, it reflects through. So we transmit the signal, and if it can reflect back, all right, that means there's a hole there. If there's no reflection, that means something's protruding there. So like on station three, if it can't reflect all the way through and isn't bounced back, all right, it knows that it has to flip that valve body. So it only rotates 45 degrees, flips the valve body, and then sends it on uh, to the next station. Okay, so we use a lot of fiber for that. Remember, fiber is just little glass wires, okay? Uh, fiber, extremely expensive, but very, very efficient. So, you know, normally if you break a small fiber sensor or cable like that, um, you can't really splice it on the small scale stuff that we work at. You have to, you know, buy a whole new piece and, and rewire it that way. So, you know, very, very sensitive. It's just, like I said, it's just glass fibers, all right? And we're able to transmit the signals using light so our, our sound wave or not sound waves but our waves uh, that we learned about in electrical class right our sinusoidal waves they transmit up and down that's really how we're transmitting uh, through fiber we also have barcode scanners right you guys see this all the time at the grocery store but even Bridgestone they put barcodes on their tires to keep track of you know where they've gone through the process and that sort of thing they're used in industry so you keep track of you know what's on the line and where it's at and those sort of things. So, you know, we use it every day, right? Grocery store. Anytime you go, let's go to the convenience score, uh, store. Everything's score, or stored on that barcode data so it knows, you know, what the price is uh, that you're paying for. So you notice pretty much almost every product in industry has a barcode on it. All right, on station two, we have the ultrasonic sensor. The word sonic should give it away because we're talking about sound waves. So what the ultrasonic sensor does is we are detecting you know, uh, the height of the valve body on station two, right? It has to be within a specific amount. It can't be too small, it can't be too high. Uh, so it's shooting off a sound wave and bouncing back. So based on that, it can detect how high that object is. Now you have to set the initial parameters on it for that to work, but that's how that, that would work. So it's, you know, same way when we're, uh, you're in a submarine and you're, you're pinging the ocean floor, and you're getting it to bounce back so that you can see where objects are. Same kind of thing. How long does it take for that sound wave to ping back to you? So that's what it's really using. We're using sound waves to detect heights of objects and things like that. Okay, strain gauge. Stress and strain gauge. We've talked about this before when we did like the Wheatstone Bridge and things like this, right? It's what you use, uh, you know, it's a scale, essentially, right? We're using a strain gauge. It's a set of resistors. All right, so as you put weight on something, you stress or strain the resistor, and that changes the value, and that value changes the voltage, right, the V out, and that changes that to an electrical signal, and then based on there, um, you know, we move forward, just like your digital scale uh, does at your house, okay? Thermocouple, all right, what's used with temp temperature sensors, all right, so it's really just, you know, basic how we protect some things with a thermocouple. Based on the heat that's given off with uh, different types of metals that are joined. So uh, if those don't match up correctly, all right, the thermocouple will open. And it's basic, it's detecting heat, all right? And the heat is generated when we have the metals, right? But it's generated from the electrical current. So as the amount of current goes through, it gives off a certain amount of heat. Um, so what'll happen is, is those thermocouples will open up uh, when the heat isn't where it's supposed to be. And that's how we protect uh, equipment as well. And we use current, and current produces, right, the heat, and the heat is what helps those to expand or stay together based on, you know, if there's too much heat, uh, they're going to open up. So we also have flow valves, right? We see a lot of those. We did a lot of that in, uh, in fluid power. Uh, 
being able to understand, you know, how much volume of liquid is being generated past a certain point at a certain time. So we know we need to know the flow rate. Uh, really big in turbine use because uh, we have to control the flow rate of water at a dam because we have to control how fast that turbine turns in order to generate electricity, right? We want electricity to operate at specific voltages and frequencies and that's going to be uh, based on the RPMs of the turbines uh, and how they affect the magnetic fields and generate the current uh, in the wires. So it's kind of very important uh, if you've ever been to the Hoover Dam or things like that in Vegas. If you, if you haven't, you need to uh, go down below. It's really cool. Uh, you can sit on the big, uh, you know, uh, two, there's not even a nice word for it, I guess, tunnels of water because you, know, you, you can drive a Jeep through them and things like that. Um, but you can feel the water flowing underneath you and how many gallons per minute are being pushed into those turbines. So, and they tell you the value there, I forget what it was, but um, you know, it's very, very important for us to understand the flow and how it's going. Um, gas station example, right? When you're putting, um, you know, fuel in your car, they have to be able to measure, you know, how much gas you're putting in. So there's a flow gauge in there that knows how fast you're putting gallons in and things like that. So that's how they know how many gallons you use versus, um, you know, so they can charge you the right price and that sort of thing. Okay, tachometer, we're using, you guys use a lot of these in the mechanical class. I gotta, you know, talk about it too much, but we're taking, we're using RPMs. So you use the reflective tape and you shot at it and it would tell you how fast the motor was spinning. All right, so we use those to generate uh, RPMs. Use a lot of those when you're balancing tires and things like that as well. All right, encoders, uh, we've talked about this little bit in uh, you know we talked about the gray code and things like that all right but we, we use encoders right so that we have motors that can keep track of positional data so like every single one of our our uh, fanic robots okay every single motor that's on there has an encoder on it why we use servo motors so they're all servo motors all right they're a closed loop feedback system so that we know where like the robot is in XYZ coordinates. So we use the encoder to keep track of the positional data, right? How much the shaft is actually rotated to the left or to the right from home. And based on that, right, because we know that each one of those can move 360. So based on how far it's moved, that's how we know, you know, where we are in the X, the Y, and the Z coordinate system. So very, very cool stuff, Bob. Remember, that's a closed loop feedback system. All right, let's start talking about some output control devices. Uh, you know, we should know what most of these are, right? We got a pilot light or an indicator light. You know, it says something's on, off. Uh, we're going to be programming if we haven't already done our uh, our traffic lights and things like that. So we're using those sort of lights. We want to be able to control relays, right? We want to be able to control solenoids. So, uh, you know, on on each station on the 870 trainer, we have our our directional uh, control valve for our fluid. But we also have what opens and closes that directional control valve is our solenoid valve. All right, so we send out the symbol for the solenoid valve to open or close, and it's just really a magnetic relay for the most part with a plunger inside. You know, but we use this to turn on motors, turn off motors. So when we do the garage door program, all right, and you tie that to station two, you got to be able to tell the motor, the, you know, the door to open or the door to close uh, when we do this. So you're going to control the two different motors for that. The other different symbols, and make sure that you know all the symbols, right, for everything we've been talking about, is, you know, alarms, beacons, lights, those sort of things, heating elements, solenoids, solenoid valve, all right, and motors, horns, all those different kinds of things, you know, that, that output, you know, for safety or to turn something on or those sort of thing. So if we want to, you know, kind of break it down, we want to talk about, you know, what's an actuator? It's a device that converts electrical signals to mechanical movement. That's really what an actuator is, right? So what, what does that really mean? Well, when we have a motor, right? We're converting our electrical signal and when we turn on the electricity to a motor, the motor starts to spin, right? And as that motor spins, that's a mechanical movement, not an electrical movement, all right? So the solenoids do the same kind of thing, right? When we break it down, what's a solenoid do? Well, we're sending uh, current through a coil of wire, the magnetic field makes a mechanical movement. It opens or closes the plunger. And you guys did this uh, in the electrical class on the AC-DC trainer, right? We 
we work with the, um, the solenoid valve, so you're able to see the plunger open and close there. And there's, you know, a whole slew of these on the 870 trainer uh, as well. But that's really what's happening, all right? We're opening and closing the plunger, and we got into this in fluid power, so you guys should already kind of know about the aspects of this and how it works. But you can see, uh, you know, pictorially here, how we're opening and closing a uh, plunger with the, uh, the solenoid controlling the directional control valve. So the plunger is more located, right? The valve for that, for the air to flow, all right? That's in the DCV, the directional control valve that we talked about in fluid power. But the coil itself, all right, is located on the solenoid, and that's what opens and or pushes and pulls the plunger, I should say. Uh, and most of these, right, we have spring return. So magnetically, we charge it so that it opens or closes, all right, and then it can return on its own, uh, spring return or gravity fed or those type of things. Okay. So we also have stepper motors. Okay, and uh, you guys have done a lot of this stuff kind of on your robots as well as we have stepper motors on the on station three on the 870 trainer so it keeps track of you know how much you turn so what we do with the stepper motor is you know every revolution so on on station three is a certain number of steps so if we need to rotate 45 degrees or if we need to rotate 180 degrees uh, we, we know how to do that all right so we're going to send the stepper motor uh, and we're going to pulse it so we know if we pulse it out for like you know three milliseconds how far it's gonna turn all right and you guys did a lot of that um, uh, when we made our robot projects and things like that those of you guys that use the uh, stepper motors okay but just discrete increments uh, in you know applying voltage and we know you know if we apply this much voltage for this much time the, the motor is gonna rotate around this specific you know this direction this many degrees really kind of uh, down. All right, talked about servos uh, a little bit earlier, right? They're closed loop, uh, stepper motors are open loop. So remember the difference between closed loop is the servo motors are constantly getting feedback, all right, from where they are. So we're, like I said, the servo motors, they're tied to our fanics and things like that. It needs to know where we are. So we keep track of where we are and how far we move so we know our X, Y, Z coordinate. With the stepper motor, we, we're open loop. There's no feedback. It doesn't keep track of where you are. It just knows, all right, I pulsed out for three milliseconds. I've moved 45 degrees. All right, I've pulsed out, you know, uh, six milliseconds. I've gone, you know, 180 degrees or something like that. Just for, you know, examples there. So it doesn't necessarily go back and forth. The stepper is just going to go in the same direction and it's going to pulse out a certain amount of time, uh, you know, so that you rotate the shaft this many degrees where the servo all right it's gonna know that all right I have here's my zero zero and I've moved this many you know clockwise I've moved you know this many degrees clockwise or I've moved this much because remember they can keep track of things whether it's angles or whether it's adhesion as well so we got Cartesian in degrees it's got to keep track of. So it knows, all right, I moved this many degrees clockwise, this many degrees counterclockwise, and it needs to know that. So that's the closed loop feedback is it's keeping track of where it's at. And that's really kind of the difference between the servos versus the steppers. Steppers, we're only going to go one direction and just pulse. Servos, we can go both directions and keep track of where we are. So some of you guys, you know, you designed your robots with servos. Some of you designed them with steppers, uh, things like that. All right, so seal-in circuits. This is very important. This is, you know, the whole point of seal-in logic uh, is just for us to make sure that things can operate in the auto position. So we don't have to sit there and hold the start button. So we have two different uh, diagrams here. One is the hardwired diagram, all right, what it looks like in the field. We have a normally open start button, a normally closed stop button. We have a seal-in contact and we have the motor starter. Now you guys are going to wire something like this up in motor controls. Uh, so you'll have this basic uh, start and stop, you know, switch for a motor that you're going to do in one of the labs, okay? But, you know, for us, programmed wise, we have to be able to seal it in. And the only way we seal this in, and this is very important because you guys are going to need this like on the garage door program and, you know, all the programs that we're going to do so they run in auto you're gonna to have to seal in the logic. So notice where the seal in goes. It's oared around the start button. So what happens here is I press the start button, 
The stop button is already energized because it's normally wired closed. That doesn't mean that I have to use a normally closed contactor there. The stop button is wired normally closed. I can still use a normally open contactor. All right, so when the stop button is pressed, okay, it breaks the wiring in the background. So, but for us, since the stop button is normally wired closed, electricity is already flowing through the stop button to the motor starter coil. So the second I hit the start button, the motor will start and run. Without sealing logic, if I take my finger off the start button, the motor will not continue to run. But with sealing logic, it will run. So when I hit the start button, the motor starter coil turns on. The second that turns on, the motor contact okay, that's in the program there closes. And that will stay closed until the stop button is hit. So that seals in the logic. So that it you use itself to turn itself on and keep itself on. So I can just press the start button. The second the motor starter coil is energized, that motor contactor that's normally open, the sealing contact, will automatically close and it will stay closed until the circuit is broke. So that's how we use seal and logic. That's going to be very important on a lot of your programs. Okay, and we'll simulate it uh, in class as well and go through it. Okay. So very, very important. Uh, this one's Alan Bradley specific. Um, this is more, you know, for wiring up and things like that. You're going to do that in a different lab and we're going to do uh, Siemens stuff. Okay. So latching relays, I'm just going to briefly touch on what a latching relay is. They hold a relay uh, closed after the power has been removed. All right. So it latches uh, so that we can remove power and something, you know, some safety mechanism might hold, stay in place um, until we need to use it again. Okay. So that's really what latching is. I'm going to read the definition here for you, but the latch coil is momentarily energized to set the latch and hold the relay in the latch position. Then the unlatch coil is momentarily energized to disengage the mechanical latch and return the relay to latch position. It's just kind of, it's an old fashioned way of using memory and storing something into memory, right? We talked about last lecture, you know, using a memory coil in your program. A latch is essentially just a form of memory. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in, you know, digital electronics when we had, you know, D flip flops or SR latch set reset latches and things like that. JK flip flops. It's the same kind of concept. We hold something in place. Uh, it, it's kind of an old school memory uh, without the computer sort of piece. So, you know, that's really what we're doing there uh, when we're using output latch and output unlatch. Okay. We're not going to do a ton of that in class. Uh, here's what it's going to look like, you know, kind of hardwired in. Uh, we're going to use more memory coils and things like that. We don't have um, those type of relays. All right. So we can use a process to control the level of water in a storage tank. All right. So it might hold stuff in that way as well. So in the manual mode, the pump's going to start if the water tank is at any level except low. All right. So as long as it's not low, so you got to think about how I just said it. As long as it's not low, all right we can use it in manual mode. So I can come over and I can push the button and it will work. Automatic mode, all right, so when the water level reaches the high point, the pump's gonna start to pump, right? We don't want it to overflow. Or when it reaches the low point, we are gonna have the pump stop, so we still have, you know, a certain amount in the tank. So just different things like that and how that all re how we can see all that and how that all relates to the ladder logic program versus the hard wiring connection. So remember the ladder logic's the stuff in the middle, the hard wires what's showing on the outside because it's actually showing the device it's going to where the ladder logic is going more to the uh, I.O. tag that it's going to. Okay, and how it all relates. This makes way more sense when we're actually in the field programming, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time, uh, you know, kind of going through this part. All right, but this is where we really want to get to converting relay schematics into PLC ladders. So we want to talk about, you know, sequential processes. Um, so a lot of things in industry, we have to do things in a certain order. In that order, we call a sequence. So this example, right, we want to fill a bottle and then cap it, right? It would make no sense if we capped the bottle and then tried to fill it. But we have to go in a specific sequence. I know that sounds like common sense to you and I, but when we program, we have to think about how the ladder logic works so that it does things in the right order, 
okay? It's kind of like order of operations in your math class. Same kind of thing, that PEMDAS stuff, if you remember that. Same kind of concept here. So one, we want to fill the bottle, and two, we want to put the caps on. They have to be done in the proper order, or the other word for order is sequence, okay? Then we have something like combination controls. We learned about this in combo logic and digital electronics. So operations have to be performed in combination with one another. So in this case, all right, placing the label on the bottle. Okay, so we have a cylinder that comes in, it holds the bottle in place, and then the label gets stuck onto it, and so on and so forth, and it just keeps doing that and coming down the line. Okay, same kind of concept that we have on the 870 trainer on station five, right? We have a cylinder that holds the valve body in place, well, it shoots the, uh, the screw and the, uh, the spool into the valve body. So same kind of thing, that's a combination, all right? And that combination has to happen in a certain sequence too, right? We wouldn't want to put the label down and then, uh, you know, extend the cylinder to hold the bottle in place. So we have to do combination and in sequence, right, when we do this sort of thing. So, you know, it's about controlling your furnace as well, right? And we did, we spent a lot of time talking about this when we did the Wheatstone Bridge in the electrical class, right? We want to maintain a certain set point temperature in the furnace. If there's deviation from that set point, right, um, we need to know, all right, do we got to turn the furnace off because it's too hot or do we need to turn the furnace on because it's, you know, too cold and that sort of thing. And we use that air, remember that was our V out that we had to calculate in the Wheatstone Bridge. All right, I told you later that would be like a control voltage. So the PLC can monitor that control voltage, uh, you know, and see, or monitor the temperature and that sort of thing. Okay, so sequential relay schematic would be here, right? And remember, the sequence for us is still the ladder logic has to be in the right sequence. Left to right, top to bottom. But you're, we're going to get into this as we program. So I want you to think about this when we do like the stop line, right? Not everybody gets to start at green and not everybody gets to start at red. So we might all start at red and then one side gets to move green while the other side's holding red, okay? And then green, it goes to amber and then to red. And then the next side, once it stays on red for a second, goes green, then amber, then red. So I want you guys to think about, you know, the sequence and how that works when we do a program, okay? I'm gonna kind of roll through this part uh, we're going to get into more of this when we actually uh, start programming. And you guys in the motor control class, we're going to do the jogging and inching stuff. So don't worry about that. All right. I just want you to be able to understand how to read a narrative and come up with a program. So this is our basic one here. We have a drilling process. It requires the drill press to turn on only if there is a part present and the operator has one hand on each of the start switches. So we have to have push button one and push button two and part present for this motor to turn on. So you can see the ladder logic, right? Those are all anded together for the motor contactor to turn on. So very simple reading the narrative, but pulling out the ands and the ors. Uh, that's really important so that we understand how to write that. Okay, if we talk about a garage door, okay, this might, now this is different than the garage door that we're gonna have in our class, okay? Um, when I'm, I'll give you that program a little bit separately, but what's it have to do? It has to go up as long as it's not going down. We have to make sure that the motor going up, all right, seals in, and we have to know when it gets to the top, right? So there has to be some sort of limit switch that tells us when we've gotten, you know, the door up so the motor doesn't keep running and keep trying to drive the door up. So... I, you, this is kind of in here, and we are going to do a garage door program, so I'm not going to lecture on it too much because I want you guys to kind of figure some of this out. Now, remember, this is Alan Bradley stuff, and ours is going to be a little bit simpler than this, but for the most part, I'd like you guys to maybe come back and actually watch this. I know some of you may not even watch this, or some of you might. We shall see. So this, this part's a little bit of a test because I'm going to, we are going to do a garage door problem, and we're going to do it to station two on the 870 trainer. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too more uh, about these processes because we're going to go through them when we uh, when we actually program in class and that sort of thing. And I'm going to be more specific when there's programs that I require you to do. Okay, so 
Um, and like I said, this is all Alan Bradley stuff. We're going to be getting into Siemens things uh, and those so. And um, we'll, when we do the Alan Bradley stuff, it'll be on a separate controller and you'll have separate labs for that. All right. So I just want you to know that's kind of why I'm going through this a little bit. I want you to just kind of glance at it because um, it's a lot more you just kind of reading and understanding it than me necessarily talking about it so that you can kind of see where the processes go and on the rungs. I want you to see the sequence and the combination of things that have to happen based on the narrative, looking for the ands or the ors and how it operates and the sealin logic, whether, you know, the run command here on line one, that's sealin logic. So that makes sure that it actually runs in auto. If you leave that off, your program will only run as long as you are hitting the stop or the start button. Those are just a lot of things that I want you to think about as you go through this process, all right? And you're going to program station one as your final, but you need to think about, you know, how it's happening, what has to be where as you're going through the situation. Am I anding something? Does this and this have to happen? Or am I oring something? Is it this or this has to happen uh, for us to get through there? You know, and there's a lot of common hiccups when you guys do those programs. I'll help guide you through those. I won't do those for you, but I will have you think about those uh, so that you understand the process. And I think the most important thing for this is for you to understand how something operates in a sequential order of events. Um, you may not necessarily know all the ins and outs of the cylinder, but you need to know, you know, if that what makes that cylinder extend and retract and when we're extending and retracting it, if that makes sense. So you need to understand how to make the system operate, not necessarily the guts of the system, but you know, why we're extending the cylinder or why we're retracting the cylinder and things like that when you guys get into programming. All right, you know, why is when I'm doing my garage door program, why is it when I get to the other side, it immediately, uh, you know, closes. So very common error for you guys is you hit the start button, you know, it traverses across and it gets to the other side, then you automatically send it back. So you got to figure out, you know, there's going to be some common errors that you guys are going to have. But I want you to think about the process. How do we know that it needs to stop there and start there and that sort of thing. So. Like normal, guys, uh, email me if you have any questions. Uh, let me know if you need a Teams meet or a Zoom meet or anything like that. Else, guys, we'll see you in class. Have a great day.